anger on the streets and a war of words between governments. How will Thursday's attack on security forces in Indian-administered Kashmir impact on the already tense relations between India and Pakistan? This is Inside Story. Welcome to the programme, I'm Sahil Rahman. A full-blown crisis is looming between nuclear rivals India and Pakistan. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is promising a fitting response against an attack in Indian-administered Kashmir that killed 44 of its paramilitary forces. Islamabad has condemned the incident and has denied supporting the group thought to be behind it. Laura Burden-Manley has more. Scenes of devastation. Body parts strewn across the Jammu Srinagar Highway in Indian administered Kashmir. Dozens were killed when a car packed with explosives rammed into a truck that was part of a security convoy. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi observed a moment of silence to remember the victims before he gave a strong warning. I want to tell the terrorist groups and their patrons that they have committed a huge mistake and they will have to pay a big price for this. It's the worst attack to hit the disputed Himalayan region in three decades. The Pakistan-based armed group Jaish al Mohammed says it's responsible for the attack. Although Islamabad denies any involvement, India has accused it of allowing armed groups to operate freely. Pakistan's foreign ministry issued a statement calling the attack a matter of grave concern, saying they've always condemned heightened acts of violence in the valley. India has taken diplomatic steps, including shutting down trade between the neighboring nations. Kashmir has been divided between India and Pakistan since 1947. Both countries claim the area. Tens of thousands have been killed in the past three decades. This latest attack targeted a large military convoy. Investigators are still trying to piece together how the armed group was able to strike such a sensitive target. What is the nature of explosion? How it has happened? Uh -huh. What led to this explosion? These are all subject of investigation. As India's National Investigation Agency begins its work, activists are on the streets of Indian-administered Kashmir with many chanting anti-Pakistan slogans and the government has shut down internet in some areas. The military has imposed a curfew in parts of Indian-administered Kashmir in an attempt to restore calm. For Inside Story, Laura Burden-Manley. Let's bring in our guests for this edition of Inside Story. From New Delhi, Sri Ram Cholia, Professor and Dean of the Jindal School of International Affairs in London. Victoria Schofield, a historian who's written a book on the Kashmir conflict, and in Islamabad, Imtiaz Gul, head of the Centre for Research and Security Studies in the capital of Pakistan. Thanks, sir, for joining us here on Inside Story. Uh, Sri Ram uh, Cholia, can I come to you first? Relations between India and Pakistan have never really normalised since independence and the subsequent partition of the subcontinent in 1947. In 2019, one can't really see this getting any better in the light of what's happened in the last, what, 36 hours. That's right, Zoel. I think uh, it's taken on a new dimension. Uh, if you could take the historical uh, you know, standpoint, in 1947, it was about territory, uh, and then you know, it morphed into something else, uh, kind of an independence struggle. Uh, by some Kashmiri Muslims with the Pakistani support. And now, you know, uh, increasing in the last uh, two decades or so or more, we are seeing that it's, uh, you know, that's the focal point is uh, this jihadist violence and the Indian counterinsurgency mm. against it. So uh, the attack on our uh, security personnel just confirms this shift. Uh, and as far as India is concerned, you know, the central point for us, you know, the point of contention is this violence against uh, our civilians and our security forces. So it is uh, being seen with a lot of outrage and uh, as uh, something that's totally beyond the pale and unacceptable. And just the scale of the attack and the number of uh, deaths of our soldiers, you know, there is a national consensus 
that uh, we must do something about it. And I think uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi okay. hates, if he hates one phrase, it is soft state. And I think he has been, his entire career has been built upon uh, having a robust national security portfolio in his governance. And now he's reaching the end of five years, his first term, I think he's increasingly going to move towards, uh, you know, a multi-pronged uh, response, including, uh, you know, tactical uh, surgical strikes okay. by special operations forces, uh, possible uh, diplomatic isolation campaign on a global scale, economic uh, punishment, and also lobbying uh, the U.S. to try and um, prevent Pakistan from getting the IMF bailout that they've been seeking for a long time, and also trying to squeeze the Pakistanis by making up with China, which is, of course, now the number one benefactor and, in a way, an overlord of, uh, of Pakistan okay. through, the, through their investments and loans. Okay, so Mr. Cholia, Mr. Cholia, you know, let me just interrupt there. Mr. Cholia, let me just... Uh, Mr. Cholia, let me come in waxed there. let me come in there. People are looking for a big... Uh, Mr. Cholia, let me come in there. Yeah. Let me just come in there. I think you've hit a lot of bases there that we need to discuss in depth throughout this whole programme. Let me bring in Victoria Schofield. You heard what uh, our guest in New Delhi had to say, Victoria. You've actually written extensively on the whole Kashmir conflict for, for many years. Is this a, a seismic shift in uh, policy from the uh, militant armed groups? Is this about homegrown terrorism on Indian soil that's been exacerbated and encouraged from Pakistan? Is Pakistan to blame? Lots of questions here about this particular attack and how it's actually impacting both on New Delhi and Islamabad. Well, I think there is a certain seismic shift in that uh, this is, Mark signifies yet another nosedive between India and Pakistan. If you're looking at the two countries, there have been several nosedives over the last 30, 40 years, but this is another very significant one. In terms of what actually is at issue, the dispute over the former princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, I think, unfortunately, in the last several decades, people have lost sight of what that dispute was. And it's almost like they're hating each other for the sake of hating each other. And this is why I think it's absolutely essential for an element of restraint to be used, because actually India and Pakistan, Indians and Pakistanis don't hate each other. But somehow the rhetoric gets whipped up with the two domestic communities that you can almost see this deteriorating into, into a war situation if that element of restraint isn't used as a prelude to sitting down finally and saying, what are we actually fighting over in relation to Jammu and Kashmir? And we have to resolve it. Uh, let's bring in Intiaz uh, Gol here. Uh, you've heard what uh, the first two speakers have said, you know, and where Victoria talks about restraint is required from the politicians on both sides of, of the border. The blame game has already begun, really, as far as New Delhi is concerned, accusing Pakistan of supporting uh, these Indian-based uh, militant groups. Pakistan denies it, as it always does through its foreign ministry. How long can Pakistan continue to take this sort of position when it's been firmly proved in the past that su such operatives are based in Pakistan, do espouse very um, extremist views about India and how both its civilians and its uh, military should be treated? Why? Why have they not acted? Well, I think in the first place, uh, the person who carried out the attack is a, is a native born in uh, Pulwama, and he may have been attached to the uh, jaish e mohammed but uh, the problem is exacer exacerbated by this finger pointing, instant finger pointing within minutes of every attack, pointing to Pakistan and equating the act of a non-state actor to that of a state, uh, state actor. So I think therein the problem lies. Pakistan has banned all these organizations. Pakistan has had its own problems, its own deaths, more than 350 suicide bombings, massive suicide bombings in the last 10 years, which have killed thousands of people. Pakistan never said that it's because of the inf terrorist infrastructure in India or the Indian support uh, for the Afghan-based terrorists. Uh, many of them are Pakistanis. So somehow uh, the Indian, Indian leadership shall have to restrain itself from pointing fingers instantly at, at Pakistan but, and engage in dialogue. There are spoilers on both sides. But, but, and I think repeatedly we have dealt with those spoilers. So Pakistan, as far as I know, has been trying to wean these people away, pull the rug from under the feet of all these organizations. Uh, but it has a socio-political dimension. 
and that is what is a restraining factor uh, for Pakistan as far as totally de-neutralizing uh, neutralizing uh, these organizations and their their huge cadre. It's okay. hundreds of thousands of people learning in their seminaries, following them. Imtiaz, so has, Pakistan has limits uh, just, to, to do uh, the things that India wants. Let me just come in there, because you talked about sort of state and non-state actors. I mean, it's the non-state actors such as Masood Azhar, who lives in Pakistan, who's admitted that it's his group and his influence that's had um, uh, behind this attack. Um, and so when somebody so vocally admits to, if you want to put it, any simply the crime, why can't the state prosecute this man, even though they've banned his group? He obviously has support, does he not, to be able to roam freely in Pakistan? Well, I think there's a very heavy fence that separates Pakistan, Pakistani and Indian Kashmir. And I haven't heard any, any direct claim from Jashi Muhammad's uh, head or their central leaders that they carried out this attack. There's a statement by a young man a native Indian origin Kashmiri. And I think now to equate that, yes, you are right. Uh, the, the organization exists here, but I think this, they are being banned, barred from taking, operating out of Pakistan. Uh, there are ideological synergies that are available, yes. And the, uh, this has born out of the original sin. Hmm. And the original sin was the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and the American response to, the, to that, for which all shades of religious organizations, entities were used by the Americans, by the West and okay. by Pakistan. And this is the spillover effect. And right now what India is dealing with yeah. is the okay. native original uh, wave of terrorism, militants that have grown with violence. And I think they don't want India to be, a, to, to, uh, to be around. So I think they, it has to be dealt with politically rather than pointing fingers at Pakistan every time a bomb goes off. OK, we, we can carry on with this debate, uh, even from New Delhi. And I know that uh, Sri Ram was uh, disagreeing with some of what you had to say uh, in terms of, you know, what we think of uh, militant and, and terrorist groups. Let's just move this on, Sri Ram, to, to one, uh, to develop this conversation more. Um, uh, Pro-Pakistan, pro-independence armed groups uh, uh, have been banned uh, by India, but seemingly operate and in a controlled way, perhaps, uh, in the, the region of Indian-administered Kashmir. It is a very militarised area. I've been there myself. I've seen how the military are deployed. It must have a huge intelligence operation in that region. So what went wrong with the intel? If you have that much military personnel and you have the intel, how did they not know this was going to happen? Yeah, sure. I mean, internal security, we need to do a lot better and uh, we need to plug a lot of the holes uh, and the, uh, you know, uh, gaps uh, through which has been exploited by Pakistan-based uh, terrorists. So, uh, but one thing is sure, you know, uh, the India has 180 million Muslims and there are only 6 million of those who are from Kashmir. So the claim that somehow um, Muslims are oppressed in India and facing human rights abuses and uh, are living under some kind of uh, colonial rule, uh, that has been exploited to the hilt by the Pakistani intelligence agencies and their proxies, like this jaish e Mohammed, uh, for example, or uh, lashkar e Tayyaba. These are proscribed organizations, but, you know, end of the day, they operate uh, right under the noses of the security forces with impunity and they raise funds, they have public rallies, they have what Jessica Stern, uh, the ac academic uh, from the US once called a jihad culture, and that has been exported to the H Kashmir Valley, which uh, we control. So Indian Kashmir also, we have a lot of youth who are uh, subject to this propaganda and to this hatred and incitement against India. And that's how they, they are being exploited to be uh, used for violence against our forces and our, and our civilians. So we have to look at the brainwashing and the indoctrination, the Salafist and the jihadist ideology that Pakistan is sponsoring. I think that is much bigger. And you look at the, you know, the top uh, heads of these organizations, they are living under the military intelligence apparatus's protection. So my own view is that this problem cannot be solved as long as the military controls Pakistan and its destiny. You know, we would want a kind of a democratic evolution there. Prime Minister Modi uh, stretched his hand for friendship with Nawaz Sharif, 
when he was prime minister in 2015, he went to Lahore. We tried it out. We, you know, we extended the hand of friendship, but it was a backstabbing all along. So I think there's a deep sense of betrayal, frustration. People don't want to engage diplomatically. Okay. So with due respect to our friends uh, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, our co-panelists, I will say that restraint is not something, an option if you're a victim. You know, if you're being hit repeatedly and we don't want to be seen to be, you know, a banana republic that can be played around, restraint is not a solution. You know, okay. we have to establish deterrence, deterrence through all means. And I think that is the consensus view here. And the deterrent is exactly what uh, Prime Minister Modi is talking about. Indiaz Gul, you know, he's talking about swift and strong action against Pakistan. What do you expect the Indian Prime Minister to do, to enact? Well, I think uh, uh, a lot of uh, people uh, within India are uh, talking about the failures of the Modi government and for the failure of the Modi government's Kashmir policies, in fact, and that he withdrew the hand, uh, hand of, of friendship or hand of dialogue from Pakistan. Pakistan has been trying its best, reaching out as much as possible to engage India. And this is, uh, uh, this is what voices from within India are also saying, that India is paying a very heavy price for, for Modi's bad Kashmir policies. A lot of former intelligence people like P. Bhadra Kumar has also talked about the abysmal failure of the Indian intelligence, but he also talks about this new generation of militants who have grown with violence under the Indian oppression the last 16, 17 years. And the real problem lies in uh, the disconnect that currently exists between uh, New Delhi and Kashmir. So what Modi and his uh, colleagues need to do is to reach out not only to the dis disgruntled Kashmiri youth, but also to Pakistan. If they think Pakistan is such a key to getting a solution for Kashmir, then I think better sense would demand that the, uh, Modi reaches out to, to Pakistan for finding a solution. Okay. It's, it simply cannot happen in, in an air of, in a vis in an air which is vitiated by a continuous a string of allegations pointing, holding every uh, Pakistan responsible okay. for everything. OK, well, let's just bring in Victoria here. I mean, obviously, it's a very heated scenario. Uh, no matter who you speak to, Victoria, whether it's in India or in Pakistan, you're hearing what our guests are saying. I mean, in terms of trying to find a solution and also trying to find restraint, how difficult is that for politicians on both sides at the moment? Because we always know there's always backroom diplomacy that goes on uh, between any two nations, and one has to assume there must be some form of backroom diplomacy that goes on between India and Pakistan. Well, there has been backroom diplomacy over the decades, and I think what one has to do in this, this current scenario is go back a little bit to the history and see what's happened before. Uh, as you mentioned, I've written on Kashmir. I wrote my first book, which was published in 1996, uh, that's nearly 23 years ago. And I'm afraid this is a repetition, different players, different prime ministers, different actors, but of, of what's happened in the past. And this is where I do think both governments have to actually take a step back and take stock. And until they do something more than uh, the tit for tat, the blame game, this is going to happen again and again. And one always keeps saying, well, the next time it happens, you know, we must make sure it doesn't happen again. But this is a rerun of, of what has happened in the past. And I feel we are losing sight of what the actual issue is. The issue stemmed, as we know, from 1947 and partition. But if you look at the state, we talk about Kashmir as though it's a monolithic hole. It isn't a monolithic hole. We're talking about people who live in the valley of Kashmir. But the Kashmir state, Jammu and Kashmir, is made up of Jammu, Ladakh, Gilgit, Baltistan, on the Pakistan-administered side and this narrow strip of land that the Pakistanis call Azad, Jammu and Kashmir. And they, they're all people there who have different aspirations. And certainly these terrorist attacks don't help um, with a resolution, and they certainly don't help the people living in the valley. Of course. Let's go to Sri Ram uh, Cholia. If, if there are politicians in India watching this programme, or certainly I'm sure they're on many domestic channels talking about how to resolve this, is it now time to try and talk, for, or should I say, is it now time for New Delhi to try and talk in a constructive manner to 
politicians, civil society, policy makers within Indian administered Kashmir to try and find out what they can do because there seems to be an impasse really on the domestic front in India, does there not? Where if the community in the region there doesn't get what it wants at the moment and isn't happy with the way they're being treated, there are demonstrations on the streets. We've seen gunfire affecting families, children, the community at large. When will be the right time to talk? I think it's got to have a significant spell of uh, no terrorism and uh, confidence building measures before we can, we can even talk about dialogue uh, with Pakistan. What no, I'm not talking about is, Pakistan, you know, Mr. Charlie. I'm not talking about you know, Pakistan. I'm talking. No, 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 Mr. Charlie. I'm not talking about Pakistan. I'm talking about the Indian government in New Delhi no, no, speaking to civil see, society these... in uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Indian administered Kashmir. They have Mo Mr. Modi's government has done very little talking. He's opened railway exactly, lines. Exactly. He's opened I'm hospitals. Not... He needs to start talking to the people, doesn't he? No, but Soil, Soil, Soil. No, let me get in, please. See. A lot of these civil society you talk about in the Kashmir Valley are themselves separatists. And they but want they are Indian nationals. They are Indian nationals. They are okay. Indian so nationals. We will only deal they with, are Indian we nationals, deal with, Mr. Cholia. We have been talking. They are Indian passport holders. They have a right. They are Indian passport holders. They do not resort to violence and who do not resort to terror. They are Indian passport holders that have the right to speak the, to their government. So, hell, the one who carried out the suicide bombing was also an Indian national. The, the one who carried out a suicide bombing was also an Indian national. Do you want us to talk to such people? We talk to those who have resorted to nonviolence and who are willing to work within the confines of the Indian constitution. And that's the most important point. We have always said, and Prime Minister Modi has maintained it, his predecessors have always said, we are willing to have an internal settlement as okay. long as you drop the secession claim. Because as far as India is concerned, we will not do dialogue with our internal citizens in Kashmir or with Pakistan as long as this claim for revisionism is there. You know, if we are okay with the status quo, if you want to reclaim part of the Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, that's what we are looking at. I don't think India uh, mm. right now or at any time in the past is willing to concede a single inch of territory or make any compromise on this. So I think within that, once Pakistan drops the claim, once the civil society in Kashmir you're talking about are willing to work within the confines of the Indian constitution and India's territorial integrity and live with it. You know, most secessionist okay. movements have died out through settlements for internal autonomy. Mr. And Mr. we are Mr. willing Chole, to grant those things uh, as long as Pakistan stays away and as long as the civil society does not go hand in glove okay. uh, in a kind of a soft separatism, which is a kind of creating the justification, Mr. Chole, the ideological I don't want justification to for terrorism. I don't want to interrupt you. I know I'm having to because we've come to the end of the programme, but I do want to go back to Victoria in London because Victoria... Uh, I know you want to get in and comment on what Mr. Uh, Cholia said, but we are heading towards an Indian general election. And what's happened here could very well play out on a much more larger national scale. I was wondering how you think this is going to play out. Uh, and well, of I course, think, uh, yes, with I think what you've this just... Is, this is the problem. I think this is the problem that it's going to... Obviously, for a domestic community, the Indian government is going to play this issue as, uh, as, as a sort of um, a, a way to... Um, garner support. If, if Modi looks uh, soft on Pakistan, this is not going to win him any election votes. But what I do want to say, it, it, which is very important not to lose sight of, is that the Indian government's policy towards the Kashmiris has been to win hearts and minds. And unfortunately, this is what they were talking about 25 years ago. But unfortunately, they have managed to do the exact reverse. And especially since I've been traveling there, the alienation in the valley is back up again. And I think this is where the Indian government has to really look to itself and say, why is this this alienation? Obviously, when you have a high military presence, you're going to have human rights abuses. And it's this cycle of human rights abuses, alienation, that the government has to get out of in order to have this dialogue to win hearts no, and minds. And it's going to be extremely difficult in this election kind of period. Ideological ground for justifying terrorism is totally unacceptable. There is no moral equivalence between the two countries, and frankly, no one is the blaming both sides terrorism. is, you know, Absolutely. the international no community has given up this whole thing. It seems, you are simply ladies and creating gentlemen, a moral Victoria restraint Sriram on both Indias. sides. For what? Who needs to be restrained? Ms. In Mr. this Chulia. case, the rogue state, the sponsor of terrorism, needs to be restrained. OK, Mr. Cholia, I think that obviously we can uh, see that this particular subject on either side of the border and even independently uh, is always a hot topic every time we uh, discuss it. And it's a very difficult, uh, certainly, scenario that both India and Pakistan are facing right now. Uh, we will...
end uh, Inside Story there, but I'd like to thank my guest, Sri Ram Cholia, Victoria Schofield at Imtiaz Gul for a very enlightening uh, conversation. Thanks for joining us here uh, in the studio. And I'd like to thank you as well for watching this edition of Inside Story. Now, you can watch the programme again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, you can go to our Facebook page at uh, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story from me, Sahil Rahman, and the Inside Story team. Thanks very much for your time and your company.